All right, folks, welcome uh, to the Inundation Maps and EAP Owner Education Workshop, uh, January 8th, 2019. My name is Chris Arick. I'm with DWR Public Affairs, and I'm going to be serving as your MC today as this wild ride through Inundation Maps and EAPs. So welcome. Um, I'm going to start off by introducing the uh, Chief of the Division Safety of Dams at DWR, Sharon Tapia. Thank you, Chris. Um, I want to, um, I'm Sharon Tapia, I'm the Chief of the Division of Safety Dams, and I want to welcome you here today. It uh, looks like the weather gave us a nice break uh, for this workshop today, and people didn't have to travel in the rain, which I know is around the, around the corner this afternoon. Um, I want to uh, thank those of you in person and as well on the phone. Uh, we did this workshop a, uh, almost a year ago uh, in 2018, January, and we found it to be very beneficial, especially in partnering with Cal OES on this presentation, because this is a, a joint effort that we're doing together per the requirements in the water code. So after we had that first workshop, uh, we felt it was very beneficial uh, for the people attending it. We got good feedback on it. And so right after we walked out of that one, Kristen and I, uh, who you'll be uh, hearing later, uh, we said, yep, we definitely got to do this again once we get our permanent regulations in place. And, and then we have everything solid going forward and be able to explain to people what the requirements are. So with that, um, I just want to thank you for attending, and I hope you find this to be valuable. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And as most of you know, this is a joint presentation with uh, DWR's Division of Safety of Dams and the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Um, just a couple notes before we have uh, our speaker welcome us from OES. This is being webcast on YouTube, and it will be up there for people to go back and look at afterwards. We're also going to be accepting questions uh, over uh, internet through email, if we could get it up and working right now, we're having some technical difficulties. So we'll give out that email address in a little bit. But before that, I want to have some welcoming remarks from the Governor's Office of Emergency Services and Julie Norris. Good afternoon, and thank you for attending this. On behalf of the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, we definitely welcome you. Welcome you and. Um, and we'd like to say thank you, too, to the dam owners um, for your res the responsibility of maintaining and, and um, operating the, your dams. Uh, we know that that is a huge undertaking, and um, we appreciate that, appreciate that. And we know that the service and the benefit that comes from the dams that you, um, that you provide and also the hazard and risk should those fail. And so in accordance with that, with the legislation, helping you and working through with you in the emergency action planning process. Um, so today we'll go through that process and what it takes to, um, to facilitate that emergency action plan along with the inundation maps as well. And so we'll work through that um, it's since the last um, program or uh, workshop that we've we've provided in coordination with DWR. We have also developed some tools, some great working tools to assist you. And so we'll, staff will come on board later on throughout this presentation to to provide some guidance on those tools and work through the EAP process. So once again, thank you very much for being here, and we appreciate all that you are doing to maintain and operate your dams. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Um, a little bit of housekeeping as well, our agenda here. Uh, we've been through our welcomes. We're going to have a presentation from DSOD on uh, inundation maps, followed by Cal OES coming up and presenting on the EAPs. Then we'll go to a question and answer. We'll have a panel up here. Uh, we'll have, we have wireless mics on both sides, so they will come to you. Uh, you don't need to come up here to ask your questions. We'll be trying to take some questions uh, via email, and it looks like we're working out a, a work through that we're, we'll have a new email address coming up uh, that we'll tell you about, and uh, we'll take questions from over there as well. So with that, we're going to pull up uh, our people from DSOD to give a presentation on inundation maps.
Thank you, Chris. My name is Kristen Martin, and I'm a senior engineer with the Division of Safety of Dams. I've probably spoken with many of you on the phone who are online and here in person. And so the way that I organize this presentation is a Q&A format because I find that to be the most valuable. If you have questions, hopefully we can provide some answers and some more information. And so my presentation will be focused only on inundation maps because that's what DSOD regulates. And then uh, Cal OES's presentation will be on EAPs. So I'm gonna jump right on in. Um, one of the questions that we get most often is what is hazard classification? Um, and, and the reason we get this question so often is because SB 92 requires inundation maps and EAPs for dams and the deadlines for these new submittals are based on hazard classification. So there are some, some definitions in the water code for hazard classification and I'd like to just clarify we also attempted to clarify in the regulations. Extremely high hazard dam is if the dam fails, it would have an inundation area of over 1,000 people. A high hazard dam, uh, if it fails, would cause the loss of life of at least one person. A significant hazard dam is a dam that if it fails is not expected to cause loss of life, but could ca cause significant property damage and environmental damage. And then low hazard dams are not expected to cause much property damage or environmental damage, and low hazard dams are not required by SB 92 to have inundation maps or EAPs. So um, one way you can find out your dam's hazard classification, or you can find out any dam in our jurisdiction's hazard classification, there's a list that we publish annually of all jurisdictional dams, and one of the attributes that it includes is the hazard classification. So you can find that on our website, which is damsafety.water.ca.gov. Um, so we have over 1,250 dams, about 1,250 dams in our jurisdiction um, all over the state. This is just a map showing um, them according to their hazard classification. Uh, if you have a question about your hazard classification or um, would like to request a reevaluation of your hazard classification. If you think it should be different, you can contact your area engineer. Um, the contact information is on the slide. We have handouts in the back. Uh, and also this, this flyer is available on our website. So how does a hazard reevaluation work? Um, the process has been formalized in our, in our new regulations. You send us a letter requesting a reevaluation and you include supporting documentation about why you think it should be different. And then we will respond to you within 60 days. And there's more information in the regulations. The regulations are now updated in the California Code of Regulations online. There's a link on our website. We also have handouts of those in the back. So if you have questions, again, contact your area engineer. What needs to be on the map? Um, because our regulations have been changing a lot this year, we've had emergency regulations and then based on feedback from all of our stakeholders, dam owners, um, the downstream public, emergency managers, um, we modified them. So this is different than the last time we had a workshop. Uh, the, the main components that need to be on an inundation map are the inundation boundary, the flood wave arrival time, the maximum depth, and the maximum velocity. Aerial imagery also needs to be on the map, and critical facilities, which are defined in the regulations. Those are facilities that are downstream that could be in the inundation area. The map needs to be stamped by a licensed, a California licensed civil engineer, and formerly our regulations were prescriptive about how this information was to be displayed, and they're no longer prescriptive. So it's up to owners and their engineers how they want to display this information as long as it's clear to emergency managers is useful during an emergency. Um, critical pertinent structures are required by SB 92 to have inundation maps. And SB 92 also added a definition about what a critical pertinent structure is, but there's still a lot of questions because dams have many different types of structures. So we, we clarified that in the regulations. So the first three bullets there, 25 feet or greater in height, impounds 5,000 feet of water or more, or DSOD determines poses a significant hazard. Those are all in the water code. 
And so I have some examples here, saddle dams, large spillways, gates on dams, if, if they meet the height or volume criteria. And then outlets and penstocks and other conduits can be considered a critical appurtenance structure according to if they pose a significant hazard. And the way that we're generally interpreting that is if um, there's a failure of those, if it would exceed the downstream channel capacity. And so if you're not sure if a structure at your dam is considered a critical pertinent structure, you can contact your area engineer and we can confirm with you whether you need to make a map for that structure or not. What are the required map submittals? So a lot of people um, think that we need a hard copy of the map. We, we don't. And we understand that the way things work now is you have to reproduce these maps in many EAPs. And a lot of emergency managers and dam owners are accessing these things in GIS apps online. And so um, we recognize that. And we require a PDF of the map and the geospatial files, or the GIS files, so that it can be used in a map application. We also require a PDF of the technical memo that documents all the modeling assumptions, and then only one hard copy of the technical memo. And that's just for our review to make sure that we can review and approve the map. And then um, we have two different mailing addresses depending on what courier you use. Those are both um, also on our website. Our review process is very similar to our review process for applications on dams, which is that once you send your, um, all your submittals to us, we send you an acknowledgment letter. We copy Cal OES so they know it's in our pipeline. And then we start our review by prioritizing the highest hazard maps. So for example, um, we're working on high hazard maps right now. And so if you submit a significant hazard map right now, we're gonna work through all the higher hazard before we start working on that significant hazard map. Once we review it, we'll send you our comments by email usually, and then you or your consultant may, can revise the map, and then we send an approval letter and we copy Cal OES again. So how long does it take to review a map? We are inundated with inundation maps, especially with the high hazard deadline just passing. Um, there are almost 500 high hazard dams, and each of those dams has at least one map, if not more, if they have critical pertinent structures. So as I mentioned, we're actively reviewing the high hazard, um, the high hazard maps, and probably later this year, we'll start in on the significant hazard early submittals that we're receiving. Those maps aren't due, according to the water code, until January 1st, 2021. So once we begin reviewing the map, um, the review time it varies from several weeks to several months, depending on how many maps are submitted, the complexity of the maps, um, and sometimes even um, how fine the data resolution is. Um, and so if you'd like a status update, you can email mapregs at water.ca.gov, or you can call our general number, which is 916-227-4644. One, one question that we get pretty often is how much do these documents cost? Um, we understand they're expensive for many owners. We did an economic analysis and discovered that the maps can cost around $25,000 per map. One of the big costs is that you need a licensed engineer to prepare these. It involves detailed hydraulic modeling. Um, and that's per map. So if you have a dam that has one critical pertinent structure, you need two maps. So um, we understand that the cost can be significant for some owners. EAPs, we've been hearing that e uh, the, they cost about $10,000 if you hire a consultant to develop them. This isn't, we never did a, an analysis on this. This is just anecdotal, what we've been hearing from owners. Um, but we also understand owners can make their own EAPs, and Cal OES's presentation after mine will go into more detail about how you could do that. And they have a lot of resources on their website also. I'll go ahead and take questions at the end. Thank you. So is there money to help pay for maps? Um, SB 92 didn't provide funding to help owners pay for maps. Cal OES is administering some FEMA grants that may be applicable. For more information, you can contact them at these email addresses on the screen. Um, there, I think probably it's also connected on Cal OES's website. And um, I think 
I'm expecting some questions on that later, so we can talk about that more during the Q&A panel. And then we sent, DSOD sent an email to owners, I believe in September, about some potential grant opportunities that we thought would be applicable. And so we'll continue to research grants as we hear of them and contact owners if we think it would be helpful. Uh, another question we're hearing is, do the deadlines apply to MAPs or EAPs? And the deadline, the way that the, the statute was written by the legislature, the deadline is for EAPs to be submitted and must include an approved MAP. Um, so you would need to submit your inundation MAP ahead of time, then get it approved, and then have the EAP developed and submitted. So we, we recommend that you submit your inundation map with enough time to review, six months, but you know that's kind of a rule of thumb and it varies a lot right now because of how many submittals we've been getting. So feel free to email us at that MapRigs email or give us a call um, at our general number and we can give you more information. What happens if I miss the deadline? This is probably the most common question that we've been getting lately because the deadline just passed. And um, DSOD and Cal OES both don't have the authority to extend the deadlines. The deadlines are written in statute. But we're committed to working with owners toward emergency preparedness. So if you miss your deadline or you think you're going to miss your deadline, send a letter um, to both Cal OES and DSOD and let us know when you think you are going to turn in the documents. If you already have your EAP, go ahead and send that um, you know, with a letter explaining the situation. Uh, communication is, is always the best option. And so I have the addresses here for both DSOD and Cal OES's programs. And then for enforcement, we always handle enforcement on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, it's always better to let us know if we know something's coming. That's always helpful. We can communicate with you. As I mentioned before, and as many of you are familiar, we had emergency regulations, we had a few different readoptions where they changed a bit, and now we have permanent regulations, which were adopted on November 29th. These are some of the changes. These aren't comprehensive. This isn't a comprehensive list. Um, the regulations are now, I mentioned, on the California Code of Regulations website, and we have a hard copy up front, and they're linked on our website also. So these are just some highlights. Um, now, when you are doing uh, an enlargement or construction application, you need to send an inundation map as part of that application. And we would review it in concurrence with our review of the application. And, th and that's because uh, the proposal would be to store a different volume of water, so it would affect the inundation area. How to request a reevaluation of a dam's hazard classification. It was a less formal process before. And also, we added a deadline for us to respond back to you, 60 days, which we thought was reasonable. Um, and then also, how to request acceptance of a sediment release modeling approach. Um, in some cases, an owner wants to sharpen the pencil and do a more detailed analysis with sediment release. So if they would like to do that, um, we formalized how they can propose that approach and, and how that process works. Also, now technical studies must be stamped by an engineer, and this would be the, the, the map already needs to be stamped, so we're just saying the study would need to be stamped also. And then uh, I have a link here to where the regulations are posted. Can you provide a list of engineers? We get this, uh, this request pretty often, too. So we don't recommend any specific firm, but you can contact your area engineer on that flyer, and they can give you a list of consultants who've worked on similar projects. Um, many owners are discovering that we have drawings of a lot of the jurisdictional dams, but not all of them, um, that are available to owners or their designated representative, like their engineer. So for more information, or if you'd like to set up an appointment, you can contact our file administrator at this phone number. We also have them scanned, so um, there is a way if you contact our file administrator for us to get that information to you about your dam. Uh, do I have to update the map in EAP? SB 92 included a provision that all maps in EAPs need to be updated at a minimum of every 10 years. Um, and then, of course, at any time there's a change to the dam or critical pertinent structure or a change in downstream development. 
uh, we added a section to the regulations for what we think will apply to many dams if there's nothing really changing at your dam and you're just doing a 10-year update. You don't need to, you may not need to, if nothing's really changing, remodel the inundation. You, but to comply with the requirement, you could submit a new map and there are details in the regulations about what needs to be different. It would need to have a new PE stamp. Um, it needs to have new aerial imagery and that's all listed out in the regulations, but we thought that this was um, probably the best way to handle this situation and not incur unnecessary expense on, on the owner's behalf. So um, those, are, those are the main questions that we've been getting. Here are some references. Um, these are the sections of water code that talk about inundation maps. Um, I threw in here the section of government code that has the EAP standards, but Cal OES will be talking about that after. And then the regulations are only for the inundation maps, the regulations I've been referencing, and they are in um, Title 23, Division 2, Chapter 1, Article 6. And again, those are linked on our website. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions that aren't answered during this workshop, you can always email us at mapregs at water.ca.gov or you can call us at 916-227-4644. If you have any questions that are specific to your dam about inspections or hazard classifications, go ahead and contact your area engineer who's familiar with your dam. And again, that contact information is on this sheet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kristen. So just to go back over, we have, for the people that are watching online, we have a couple email addresses that you could send questions to, the maps, regs uh, that we just referenced. Let me see if I can go back, there we go. Map regs at water.ca.gov, and then also uh, we have another EAP at Cal OES. Uh, .ca.gov, which will be up on your screen. We can't see it here in the in the building, but that is another address that you can send questions to when we get to the Q&A, and we'll be doing that after our next section. Um, so next up, we have Casimir Kitt from the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Um, so this is the second part. The first part, as you know, the inundation maps, and now we're going to talk about EAP. So Casimir. Good afternoon. What did the fish say when he swam into the wall? Oh, damn. <laughs> Welcome to our emergency action plan workshop. My name is Kazmira Kitt. I'm an analyst with the Dam Safety Planning Division of the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. <clears throat> Following this presentation, we'll have a full hour for Q&A, so please do hold your questions to the end. Now we're all here today with a common mission, and that mission is to develop a comprehensive and consistent emergency action plan, or EAP, that does the following. It protects lives and reduces property damage. So I wanna thank all of you for being here in person and online today to join us in this mission. Now we're also here today because, well, legislation requires that you have an EAP. So I understand that. There are two guiding documents for an EAP. It's California Senate Bill 92, which you might have heard referred to as SB 92, and also federal regulations, and that is FEMA's Federal Guidelines for Dam Safety Emergency Action Planning for Dams. I would like to highlight some portions of the government code section 8589.5 for you, since I doubt any of you wanna go home and read through the legislation, I'm gonna give you the cliff notes. So the three important things you need to remember about 8589.5 are first, that it requires that your emergency action plans adhere to those federal guidelines, so the FEMA document. Second, it requires that public safety agencies be involved in the creation of your emergency action plans. And we'll give you some strategies on how to do that as we go through this presentation. And then third, we do require, the state requires an annual exercise of your EAP. And we will discuss what that involves as well. Kristen covered the water code well. So we're going to move on. The legislation, I feel, can be a little overwhelming. 
and so can the thought of creating an emergency action plan. So what I'd like to do is to break it into smaller steps, like we would for any large project, and we're gonna use the very traditional five-step project management approach. So we're going to start with initiation, how you get started on your EAP, and then number two, planning, three, execution, four, performance and control, and finally, the close. And you will see these cued as we go through the presentation so you'll know where we are at in the process. You can follow these five steps to write your own EAP, save yourselves $10,000. Sounds good, right? So while the EAP results in a plan that protects lives and property, we've discussed that already, the process of creating or revising that plan is going to develop the knowledge, the competencies, and the relationships that make that plan actionable. So in the end, I believe you will find that the process and the development is just as important as the product. Perhaps best summed up by a quote often attributed to Dwight D. Eisenhower, he said, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. Not to say that your EAP is worthless, but it's that planning process that will prepare you for an emergency. So we're gonna start with the five steps. Step one, do you guys remember? Initiation and congratulations. Just by being here today, you have all completed step one. So if there's five steps, you're 20% done, right? All right, so let's get started on step two and you'll leave here with part of the planning finished as well. We'll break that planning into three segments. We're gonna talk scope, identifying the players, and the workflow. So we'll begin with the scope. Now every dam is different. The areas downstream of every dam are unique. Therefore, the scope of every EAP will be unique. So what I'd like you to consider is who are all the entities, jurisdictions, and agencies that would be affected by an incident or have statutory responsibilities for warning, evacuation, and post-incident actions. So those might be upstream and downstream dams, the inundation area, local emergency responders, major traffic routes, adjacent recreational areas, or local utilities. By going through this scope exercise that will help us identify our stakeholders and our partners in a dam emergency. So let's take a closer look at all of those involved in creating our EAP. You can think of three groups of people who will be involved with an EAP. So the first is your dam personnel, your local stakeholders, and then your national and stake, state stakeholders. The dam personnel would be involved in creating, editing, updating, and of course, activating the EAP. Your local stakeholders would be involved in giving you input into your EAP and also providing an emergency response. And then your national and state stakeholders will grant approval to your EAP and perhaps coordinate an emergency response. So, so far we've just defined the scope and identified the key players. So the final part of our planning process is to draft the project flow. And you can think of it as three major tasks that can be accomplished more or less simultaneously. So your inundation mapping can happen at the same time as your EAP research and writing at the same time as your stakeholder outreach. You bring them all together and create your emergency action plan. So that's the end of the planning phase and we move on to execution. So that says distribution of tasks. I apologize, it doesn't display quite right for you. In the planning stage, we identified the personnel to accomplish the tasks. So in the execution stage, we will assign the tasks and then begin work. And here I've broken it out into four tasks. I realized before it was three. The research and writing and editing could perhaps be done by one person or broken up. Inundation mapping will probably be done by a third party engineer, unless you happen to be one yourself. Outreach will cover a little bit more on the next slide, and then that researching, writing, and editing can be accomplished by one person or one group of people, or you can break that up. Now that stakeholder outreach can seem like the most intimidating because it requires coordination and documentation. So I wanna get you started on some suggestions and tools to help you be successful in the outreach portion. We encourage you to view your local stakeholders and the governor's office of emergency services 
as your partners rather than obstacles. We're here to help you. So you identified the stakeholders in the earlier scope exercise. In this execution phase, we will ask you to meet with those stakeholders and discuss possible emergency actions. In that meeting, you will discuss things like what are the roles and responsibilities of the stakeholder in an emergency? How will you contact them? Where are they in the notification flowchart? And what would you do if the contact or primary means of contacting them was unavailable? And what emergency actions does that stakeholder commit to? To guide and document these interactions, we are developing an agenda that you can use to guide that discussion and document, or you can document it in other ways. I'll give you another example later, but you must document that outreach. It's an essential part of that planning process and developing the EAP. <coughs> And then the Cal OES reviewers, there are many of us here today. You will hear from Lori later. Kendall's hiding in the back of the room. We have Phil here. <laughs> We're all here to help you. We talk with dam owners via email or the phone every day, and we want to see you succeed, and we want to help you with your emergency action plan. So please reach out with questions and let us know if you're behind so that we can keep track of where you're at and what actions you're taking to get your emergency action plan completed by the deadline because in the end, we are also committed to an EAP that preserves life and reduces property damage. You'll hear that like two or three more times. So let's wrap up the execution phase. Of course, we're gonna be executing the tasks. I encourage you to implement a tracking mechanism so that you know where you're at in the project. You may hold status meetings. And then of course, prepare for the unexpected. Any large project that you've undertaken, I'm sure you've run into snags. It took longer than you expected, so please, plan for that. And that brings us to step four in the process. We're in the performance and control. So that says performance and control, and then under the line it should say critical elements. Your EAP will be evaluated based on its adherence to federal and state guidelines, and that's why I provided you with those references at the beginning of this session. So your completed plan should have two main elements. It'll have the EAP and the inundation map. The EAP itself, you can organize in pretty much any way you want, but we do recommend this format for ease of use in an emergency and ease of review. Again, the format itself is not specified. So we would have the front matter, you'd have sections one through eight. Isn't this exciting? You can all read that, right? We'll cover that in detail, I promise you. And any appendices. The appendices often have things like a review checklist, notification flowchart, forms and logs. So that's what's in the appendices. <clears throat> These two components of your emergency action plan, the EAP and the inundation map, will be reviewed by their respective agencies. So DSOD will review your inundation map, but we do not recommend waiting until that map is approved before beginning the EAP process. So again, and a nation map can happen at the same time as outreach and the same time as your editing and research and writing of your EAP. Once your inundation map is complete and your EAP is complete, you'll submit that completed package to the Governor's Office of Emergency Services for review and approval. And we use a review tool to ensure that all the required components are there and you have access to this review tool as well. So it's like having the answers to the test. If your EAP meets all the criteria of that review tool, you can expect a pretty quick approval and few to no revisions. If the elements are missing, you will receive a letter back from us asking for some revisions. So you've met all the requirements of the review tool. Your inundation map was approved and Yay, your EAP was approved. Now you throw it in a drawer and you shut it and you forget about it forever, right? Well, not quite. So over the next year after your EAP is approved, you'll do two things with it. You're going to exercise it and maintain it. Because think about it, EAP stands for Emergency Action Plan. So let's take some action. The legislation requires that the EAP be exercised once a year by June 30th. And this exercise is a notification exercise of the flowchart, otherwise known as a call-down drill. 
So the purpose of this drill, you're going through your notification flowchart in the case of an emergency, is first to refresh those minimum emergency procedures for your dam personnel, identify any gaps or errors in that notification process, and prepare to preserve life and reduce property damage. California law requires this be done by June 30th every year. You may, and we encourage you to, to conduct other exercises like seminars, workshops, tabletop exercises, drills, functional exercises, et cetera, just to improve your own readiness for an actual emergency. And if you do so, please let us know. We will participate if possible, and we will certainly log it and keep track of what we're all doing to prepare for a dam emergency. <clears throat> And of course, if there is an actual emergency at your dam, your emergency action plan is there to guide your actions. Now, if we didn't periodically maintain the EAP, it would be quickly become outdated and ineffective. So if there's a critical change, don't wait for the annual review. The EAP should be updated promptly if there are changes in personnel or contact information, significant changes to the facility, or any updates to your emergency procedures. At a minimum, the EEP should rev be reviewed annually for adequacy and then updated as needed. So that review should include any evaluation of changes in the flood inundation area, in downstream developments, or in the reservoir. FEMA P64, the document we saw at the beginning, does have an appendix, Appendix A, that has an EAP review checklist to guide you through that process. And once the changes are made, you've done your annual review, you will distribute those changes to your plan holders. FEMA P64, again, gives you great guidance to how to do that. They have Appendix I that has an example record of plan holders and an example record of reviews and revisions. Because an old or outdated EAP is pretty much worthless. So we need to keep it exercised and maintained. So now that we've covered the project cycle of the EAP, we've gone through, through steps one through five, you've gotten step one done, head start and step two. We'd like to share some common errors and best practices we've seen in the EAPs that we've reviewed so far. So some of the common errors, <clears throat> the first one is due to using an outdated template. Before the 2017 legislation, there was a template that was based on 2014-15 information, and it is it doesn't incorporate the latest guidance, and it also doesn't incorporate all the guidance in FEMA P64. So any EAP that we see prepared with this usually goes back with about 32 revisions. So I don't recommend using the old template. I do recommend reviewing the FEMA guidelines. Two of the major things that we see Incorrect in EAP or using the old template and not reviewing the FEMA guidelines and not doing things and using the wrong emergency levels. FEMA guidelines specifies these four levels or skipping section, the preparedness section in the FEMA guidelines. Again, you probably heard this a few times. Don't wait till your inundation map is approved to begin your EAP process. You can start today. And please do let us know what your dam's physical address is, if it has one. And if it doesn't, please specify that. So the, plan, the point of the EAP is to send emergency responders to the right spot. And we want to be sure we have a good location for your dam. So let's end with a positive note and some best practices. Best practices, read the FEMA guidelines. It's way better than the legislation. <laughs> So federal guidelines for dam safety, emergency action planning for dams is your number one resource. It's available online. There is a link from the Cal OES website. You can also find it with an internet search. It's easy to read. It's simple. It's very clear. If you read it and follow that guidance and incorporate those three extra things from Senate Bill 92, you'll have an EAP that passes. If you conduct a pre-review with our Review tool, again, you will likely pass the approval process on the first try, and we strongly recommend you begin the EAP process before the inundation map process is complete. The research and the outreach portions do take some time. It takes some time to gather that data. It takes some time to meet with people and get their input. So while your map is in the process, you can get that done, and then you can incorporate any changes that your map determined into your EAP and put it all together. I'd like you to consider 
your fellow dam owners as resources. Exchange contact information, they're in the same boat you're in. They might be able to help you with things like an engineer or who helped them with their EAP. So please, exchange contact information before you leave here today. And then the remaining resources are on the Cal OES website, and I realize you cannot read that here. It says caloes.ca.gov slash dams. And there we are working on the first two, a project flowchart to help you visualize the tasks that will be required to complete an EAP, how it all fits together, and a stakeholder meeting agenda, again, to help you guide those interactions. And the last three are up there now. We have the Cal OES EAP review tool, which we will cover in depth for you. I know, can't wait. The EAP blank formatting template, which is a shell that you can put your information in and be sure not to miss any pieces. And then the Santa Luisa sample EAP, which is an EAP based on a fictional dam in a fictional city, but it incorporates all these best practices. So if you learn best by seeing how somebody else did something, take a look at that and you probably picked up copies of the review tool and the Santa Luisa dam on your way in. So we're here today from different waterways, different agencies in different counties, but with a common mission. So we're here to develop a comprehensive and consistent emergency action plan, this last time I'm gonna say it, you guys ready? To protect lives and reduce property damage in the case of a dam failure. And we understand that an emergency action plan process can be overwhelming, so we recommend that you try a five-step project management cycle like this to help you get through the steps. And of course, we and the resources are here to help you. We're all committed to making California a leader in dam safety and making our communities more resilient. For the rest of our time, what we'd like to do is cover two of the products that I hinted at earlier that really can be of a lot of use to you. So the first that I will cover is the Santa Luisa Sample EAP. And if you pick that up on the way in, it's not obvious right away what it is. It looks like this. Yours probably doesn't say Casimira's copy, but it probably does say forward. All right, so this is that sample EAP that you can look at to see a best in class example of how you can create an emergency action plan that performs and passes the review tool. So I'd just like to highlight a couple things on this. And the first is the cover. So it's two pages in. It has a few of the elements we often see missing, but we want to see on the cover because again, this is supposed to be an actionable, actionable document. We need to see right away, what is the name of the dam? Who owns it? What county is it in? What's the hazard classification? And what is the DSOD number? That's the Division of Safety of Dams number that every dam is assigned. So look for those things on the front. And then I'd also like to highlight page five of that emergency action plan. It says dam contact information. We're looking for this at the front of the document because again, in an emergency, we don't wanna have to hunt for this information. So this is where you should list your dam owner your dam operator, if they're the same, let us know. An emergency contact for the dam, 24 hour, and your EAP coordinator, and how we get in touch with those people. And then in here, you also see a really great example of how to document that public, public safety agency or stakeholder participation. So I mentioned you could use an agenda. You could also do something like is on page two, in the sample EAP, and here it says that the coordinator worked with a core planning team to develop this plan. Key participants included the Santa Luisa Office of Emergency Services, the Santa Luisa County Sheriff's Department, and the Santa Luisa County Fire Department. The National Weather Service and city officials were also contacted for their input. So right there we have proof and documentation that the Santa Luisa Dam worked with their stakeholders, took that information, and they incorporated it into the document. So that's here for you online as well as a hard copy. It's a great example for you to work from. And now I'd like to introduce Lori Newquist. She's a Senior Emergency Services Coordinator in our division, and she will talk you through the Cal OES review tool.
Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to also be here. Um, I've probably talked to quite a few of you before on the phone. Um, may have met a few of you at some different things that we have been at. Um, so thank you for your time today and being here and also being online. So as you know, Casimira just went through a lot of information. And what I want to do now, we've talked about there's an EAP review tool. And this EAP review tool really is kind of your checklist. It's kind of an answer sheet. Um, and it, this is really, really going to help you because, um, you know, it, it, w the reason that we created it was because we want to make sure it's meeting all the statutory requirements and that we can provide feedback to you as well um, to help you create your EAP, make it better, and that, again, that you've met those requirements. Um, so I'm going to go into it um, in depth, not too, too in depth, um, considering how much time we have. Um, and we've also, Kesmer already went through a lot of these things, but there is quite a few. There's nine sections um, in the review tool. Oh, okay. Sorry, it's a little bit different than how this is set up. Can you, oh, now how this is going to work. Yeah. So I don't know if you all were able to get a copy of the review tool. I don't know if you have enough copies for everybody. But if you could take a look at that, um, and I'm going to go through it. Sorry, this isn't going to come up on the screen very well. Um, but if you could take a look at the copy you have, and I'll just kind of go through it real quickly. Um, so the first page um, of the review tool um, basically just gives you a kind of a summary of what I just basically said and why we created this document. Um, so what we're looking for on the, the front page is, you know, obviously some main information, some key stuff. What county, what city, the name of your dam, um, the date of the plan that you submitted. Um, thank you. Um, and your DSOD ID number. Um, if you have a FERC project number, we'd like that on there as well. Um, we would like your hazard classification. Um, who's the owner? What's your name? <laughs> who's the ti what, what's your title? Your contact information, your phone number, your address, your email. Um, so those are really key pieces of information that we need. We need to be able to contact you when we're reviewing these. Um, at the bottom of it, you'll see we have a section for state reviewer. Um, and that's going to be whoever is assigned to it from our section. So you'll have our name, our title, our contact information as well so that you can um, work directly with us. Moving on to the second page of the review tool is the front matter. So this is the front of your review or your EAP basically. So what are we looking for here? So section A, um, again, we're looking for um, name of the dam, relevant um, identifiers such as NID. Do you have an NID number? Everyone should have an NID number assigned to their dam. Um, there should be your DSOD number, your FERC number, um, and make sure it's clearly labeled in large letters um, along with the, sorry, as long as you can, um, as long as we can see it in large letters so we can see it clearly. Um, as well as, do you have a table of contents in your EAP? We've had quite a few of them come through, and the table of contents may be in there, but it may be in the middle of the plan. So we understand this, this is your plan. You create your plan as you want. We just want to make sure that you meet all those elements that are required. Um, but we do encourage you to, to put your table of contents in the front of the plan. Um, within that table of contents, we want to make sure that you are including all the sections that are listed within the EAP um, that we're looking for. Make sure it's clearly labeled and, and the page numbers are in there. The page numbers um, and the sections match where it's at in the EAP. Because sometimes you'll put it in the, in the table of contents, but we'll miss a page number. Or the page numbers will be off because you added another page. So just, just be conscientious of that. Um, Again, we're looking for, like we said before, we're looking for um, name and contact information that it's clearly identified. Um, who's the dam owner? Um, who is the operator, the EAP coordinator? Um, and is there an emergency contact? 
We would like for all that information to be on the front of the plan, but if you do not have that on the front of the plan, at least on the next page would be great. Moving on to section one is the introduction. And so is there a purpose statement? What is the purpose for your EAP? If you could provide us a little bit more information on what it is that um, your dam does, um, that would help us. Um, so just go a little bit more in depth and, and kind of make this plan your own. Um, the next one is our public safety agencies part of the development process. And Casimira already kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, are you working with your local um, emergency managers? Are you working with all those who would be involved in an incident if something happened? Um, we encourage you to reach out um, to them and work with them regularly. Um, but again, there's no requirement for them to do it. Sometimes they may not be able to be there for everything, but we do ask that you document that you have reached out to them. Moving on to section two is a summary of the EAP responsibilities. And that we're going to, what are, what are the dam owner's critical responsibilities? What are, their, what are they required to do? So we're looking for, um, what are they gonna do if an incident happens? Kind of a step-by-step -step guide that's gonna tell us um, what, what it is that they do for, um, in their position when something happens. Um, moving on. Are the impacted jurisdictions identified? Are they listed? Have you, you know, within the inundation map, have you identified who those are and listed them? Um, and are you working directly with them? Moving on to section three with the notification flowchart. Hold on. I apologize on how this is set up. Um, do the notification flowcharts include contacts for timely notification for local emergency management? Who, who have you included in your flowchart? Um, and is it timely? Um, what we're looking for is three to four contacts at a time per, um, per um, agency who's listed. Um, is the Cal OES State Warning Center listed? Um, and what we ask too is sometimes the, the duty officer will be listed for our southern region or inland region or coastal region. And we ask that you don't include them because we need a 24 hour contact. So that would go directly to our Cal OES um, warning center. The next one is, do you, have a, do you include a primary and backup communication system um, for your dam owner communication with first responders and key stakeholders? So that's really important. We want to make sure that there's backup communication. Is, who is your backup? Um, is that a 24-hour you know, contact? Is there a phone number? Is there an email? So we want to make sure there's at least two. Moving on to section four is the project description. Um, have you identified what your project um, description is? Um, what are we looking for? You know, location of the site, the upstream, downstream um, dams, communities. Who's going to be affected by this if there is an incident? Um, are the critical appurtenant structures identified? Um, and as you know, um, Kristen already went into that a little bit and what the requirements are for that. So we want to make sure if, if there are none identified, please state that. Uh, moving on to section five is the EAP response process. Are there detection and early warning systems that the dam clearly um, described for like dam operators observations, are, are there instrument systems that are identified um, that will be identified in, in for the public? Um, what kind of systems are you using with your dam? Please identify what that is. And not all of them are gonna be the same. I mean, bigger dams are gonna have entirely different types of systems than a smaller dam. 
are the emergency levels clearly described? Um, so please make sure that when you're, you're identifying these levels um, that you're hitting the, the, the levels that are required. And in focus to also, if you need any more information on that to help you, guide you, is the FEMA Federal Guidelines for Dam Safety. Um, so P64 basically will give you that information. And if you haven't noticed already, under each one of these items, it gives you the guidelines for where to find the information to help you. Um, moving on to the notification procedures on how to use the flow charts and the alternate contact table. Is there an alternate contact table? There should be. Um, because just in case, what if the, the first contact isn't available? Um, you want that to fall to somebody else. Maybe uh, you know, a second, a third. Just make sure you have an additional page in there that provides that information. Have you created emergency notification information and message templates? That's a great idea to have those in the very beginning. You don't want to be last minute, right in the middle of an emergency incident, trying to figure out how you're going to notify all these um, other emergency responders and let them know what the situation is, right? You want to make sure you have those already identified in the very beginning. So when you make that phone call, it's quick and concise. Are there steps listed um, for the termination process? And who is going to be responsible for the termination process? Is there a process for follow-up on how the plan was used or in lessons learned? Are you going to complete um, an after-action report? Are you going to do a hot wash? Are you going to create something that is going to be that you can meet with all those key people that were involved in the incident? And, and work with them on best practices. What went right, what went wrong? How can we make this better? Uh, moving on to section six is general responsibilities. Are dam owner responsibilities included in the plan? Again, we wanna make sure that um, you identify the responsibilities um, for each of these people who are gonna be instrumental in, um, in handling the incident. Are the notification and communication responsibilities included? And what are those? How are you gonna be notifying and communicating with everybody? How are, you gonna, how are you gonna handle the evacuation and who's gonna do it? Who would be responsible for doing the evacuation? It's not the dam owner, it's gonna be the local law enforcement. It's gonna be the sheriff's department, right? Have you identified um, how you're monitoring your dam, the security? Um, how's that being done? Is that, is that something that you're, you have someone who's walking around the dam and kind of doing that daily? When is that being done? Is there a schedule for that? And who's responsible for doing that and handling the security of it? Um, and is, who, is the, who is the EAP coordinator and what are their responsibilities? So you want to identify what those are. And again, Kazmira had mentioned too that some of these, some of these um, titles may all be the same person. And if that's so, let's make sure that in the EAP that you have identified that. In section seven, we go into preparedness. And in that section, we're talking about surveillance and monitoring activities. Again, that's the same thing. You might have a system that does that for you, or you may again have somebody who's just walking around and identifying if anything's going on and monitoring it. So either way, let us know how you're doing that. What's the schedule for that? Is there an evaluation plan for detection response timing? Again, it's, it's monitoring and making sure that you, you know what that process is and how that's being done, who's doing it. Provide us that information. Um, does the plan provide a route to obtain access to it? I'm sure there's a route to get to it, but what if that route um, is blocked because of the, the incident? Um, is there an alternative route? So we wanna make sure we know what that is. Does the plan provide information regarding response during periods of darkness, um, weekends and holidays, during adverse weather? 
All those things are key, you know, especially given the type of um, incident it is and what time of year it is. Um, we want to make sure that um, we know whether there is somebody who is monitoring it 24-7 and are they doing it during those periods of time. Um, is there alternate sources of power identified? What happens if, if the system goes down? What happens, if, are there backups, uh, generators or anything like that? What, what's gonna happen if the power goes out? Who is that gonna affect? Um, or contact information for emergency supplies um, available. Have you identified that in case of an emergency that you can quickly contact in case you need that information, you need those supplies? Um, have you worked with them and, and established that? Maybe even have a backup to that as well. Um, what about supplies, maybe resources and equipment, maybe already on site? Can, have you identified maybe that? Because some of these dams may already have some of that available and so that's important to know. Um, is there information on how to provide and coordinate information between responsible parties? And we kind of, we kind of talked about that a little bit earlier on. Um, but you also, you know, what type of communication are you using? Again, if, if the power goes out and there's no way to use the normal landline, how are you going to communicate? Do you have cell phones? Do you have walkie-talkies? Or, you know, I don't, I don't know what you would use, but you want to identify what that be. Um, and have you, have you identified that you will be handling an annual notification exercise? Is that in your document? Um, and how, how are you going to be doing that? Is it going to be a tabletop as well as the annual notification call out, which is the requirement, but what kind of exercises are you going to be doing? Do you already know what type of exercises you're going to do and when you're going to do them throughout the year? Who will be invited to those? Um, and then kind of going into um, public awareness measures. How are you reaching out to the public to let them know in case of an incident um, how they would um, handle that? What, where would they go? What would they do? So it's just making sure that you establish some type of public awareness, um, working maybe with a local PIO um, and identifying that communication, doing workshops and um, things like that. Um, when, who's going to be updating your EAP um, and revising it and how often? Um, and the distribution. Make sure on the distribution as well that um, all plan holders um, that this goes to are also the same ones that are on your flowcharts. So you want to identify who's on your flowcharts, who you're contacting, and make sure this EAP is being distributed to every one of those as well. And the last section goes into inundation maps. Um, and again, we're looking for, we're making sure that um, you have, um, we have an approval from DSOD that their inundation map has been approved. And we want to make sure that it is the approved map that you have included in your plan. Um, so we, we will be checking with you to make sure that after we receive that letter from DSOD that there was an approval, that you have submitted the actual approved map in there. And that concludes um, our EAV review tool. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this back over to Chris. Thank you. So a lot of very important information, both on inundation maps and EAPs. We're going to be going now, and let me get our PowerPoint up to our panel so that you could ask all the questions that you got during these presentations. So if our panel could come up to the table. Come on, Jose. Yeah. So for online, once again, we have, uh, it should be on the screen, there's two different email addresses that you could send to. You could send to mapregs at water.ca.gov, that's M-A-P-R-E-G-S at water.ca.gov, or you could send to E-A-P at caloes.ca.gov. Once again, E-A-P at caloes.ca.gov. I am going to have our panel introduce themselves, and then once again, we have 
microphones on each side. Uh, we will take some questions. I know we got some questions in online already. We'll take a question from there and then question from the audience and kind of rotate back and forth. So we'll start with Jose, if you can introduce yourself and let us know what you do and where you work. How's it going? My name is Jose Lara. I work for the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, and I'm the Chief of the Dam Safety Planning Division for Cal OES. Hi, my name is Kalita Fazel, and I am with the Division of Safety of Dams. I am an engineer in the design branch um, who's been working on developing the policy for our inundation mapping regulations, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm Kristen Martin. I'm a senior engineer with the Division of Safety of Dams. I work in the reevaluation engineering branch, and I've also helped develop policy for the inundation maps with Kalita. So for questions, if you have a question for a specific person, just please address them and let us know who you'd like to answer. If not, then the panel could decide who's the best person to answer it. We're going to start over with our online. Do we have any questions to start us off? Sure. Okay. Uh, so the first question is, we submitted the EAPs, including the inundation maps, before the deadline. However, the inundation maps are still pending approval from DSOD. Is there anything else we need to do while waiting for approval of the inundation maps from DSOD and EAPs from Cal OES? I'll go ahead and take that question. Um, we understand that there are many dam owners in this situation because as I mentioned during my presentation, we've been inundated with inundation maps. And so we're working our hardest to um, review and approve inundation maps according to the regulations. Um, so to answer the question, no, there's nothing else you need to do. The agencies communicate with each other. Um, and so Cal OES understands that, that we have a backlog and that we're working through it. Um, but if you have questions about the review status, you can contact us. Um, your area engineer would be probably the best person to contact. Um, and then, uh, Jose, do you have anything to add to that on the EAP end of things? No, I, th I, th I think Kristen's got it. We work very closely um, t together all the time, so um, so we are aware of, of the backlog, and, and we'll work with you um, as well as DSOD to, to make sure we, you know, we deal with this as it comes. So, Questions for the audience? If you want to raise your hand, one of our staff members will come out with a microphone. I think it looks like we have one right here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's all right. I'm going to this thing. So the regulations, you said the deadlines are based on the EAPs. Um, I guess it's a similar question. Then if they're not approved, I heard that Cal OES won't look at the EAPs until the, um, the maps are approved. Is that true? And should we still submit the EAPs? So, so the legislation requires that the inundation or that the EAP be based on an approved inundation map from DSOD. Um, so we are unfortunately able to review um, to re review most EAPs unless it is a pre-existing um, EAP from March. Is it 31st or? First. March 1st, 2017. Okay, yeah. for March 2017. Um, so let's assume that you did, it's not a pre existing one. Um, um, we, we are unable to review it. However, I don't want that to be the reason why dam owners are delaying um, the development of an EAP or the updating of an EAP. We want you to just begin working on it now. Um, our office is here to assist you, and the planning process does take you know, more than a month or two to develop. You have to make sure that you do public um, um, or outreach to not only the, the public safety agencies, but generally the community around the dam. Um, so there is a few steps that you can begin working on immediately. So don't delay. But still, we, we, we can't submit it. You know what, we, we're, we're not telling anybody to not submit it, um, especially if you have a deadline that is upcoming or past. We want, we, we'd rather you begin working on it, updating it, working with us, submit what you can. We may be able to review it in advance of the actual, um, um, of the actual uh, formal um, review just because we may have that opportunity. Or we may be able to give you some guidance in the meantime. Even though it may not be a formal review, we'll still continue to work with you so that by the time you're able to, to formally submit it and we're able to actually review it, your, your EAP is on the fast track because you've already worked out all the kinks. So, Jose, just let me clarify. I think what I heard from some of the speakers is 
don't wait to not put in your EAP because the map hasn't been approved. Go ahead and submit your EAP while the map's being approved if it's already done. Also, don't wait to start your EAP until your map's approved because there's a lot that needs to be done with the EAP while you're waiting for the map to be approved. So they could go ahead and submit it with the map that they've sent to yeah. DSOD and, it, and you just wait for that approval letter from DSOD before you formally finish up the process. That is correct. Online questions. Okay, um, so the next question is, the EAP template provided on the Cal OES website has many blank pages. Are there any additional resources available to assist in developing an EAP? Yes, um, so the Santa Luisa sample um, that, that has been publicized on the Cal OES website, and you go to calos.ca.gov backslash dams, that will get you directly to our website, does have the quote unquote Santa Luisa sample. Now, we say sample because we don't do templates for EAPs. Each EAP, each emergency action plan should be tailored to your individual dam. And of course, because dams are, you know, there's such a, a spectrum of dams, they couldn't possibly have one template that covers everybody, right? Um, furthermore, this is the, the, the dam owner's plan um, uh, during an emergency situation. So we do expect that you're gonna be taking a look at your policies, your procedures, um, inherent to your dam, put them all as part of the planning process, and then develop that plan. So the Santa Luisa uh, sample is up in our website. You can feel free to take a look at that sample if you're a more visual person. Um, however, if we do see the fact that somebody carbon copied it and just slapped on you know, Jose's dam on top of that, we're gonna, we're gonna maybe take a second look at that EAP. Um, I also wanna make, a, um, make sure that, that it's stated that an EAP's uh, planning process is commensurate to the actual dam itself, right? If you have a 50 or 500 acre dam versus a 500,000 acre or 500,000 acre feet dam, well, the planning process should look a little bit different, right? You are gonna have a bigger footprint. You may have to work with a few more public safety agencies. There may be a little more detailed um, um, aspects to your dam. So we also wanna make sure that we, 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 we make note of that because I don't want a small um, dam to feel that there is a requirement to have a 10 inch binder, um, I'm exaggerating, six inch binder like other, some of the other larger dams in California. Um, and uh, the uh, person who asked the question was asking about a different document. Do you want to talk about that one also, the blank formatting template you have? Oh, I'm sorry. So we do have a blank formatting template that is just strictly there to, to show you how you can organize your EAP and how we have, so that way we have more of a standardized format. You got to understand the public safety agencies will have multiple dams in their jurisdiction. So we, that's what we're trying to standardize the key aspects of, of a dam. Um, the blank formatting template is just that. It's a blank formatting template. So it's meant, I mean, it's not gonna have anything filled in. If you want a little more meat to the bones, feel free to refer to the Santa Luisa uh, um, sample um, to get you more information. And Jose, you have cop hard copies of those documents here today, right? In fact, we do. So some of our dam owners that might be viewing online that might be, shall we say, digitally challenged, mm -hmm. can they email or call you and get a hard copy sent to them? Absolutely. Um, once again, e uh, our email uh, for the division is eap at caloes.ca.gov. You email us. Call us, um, go on our website, uh, we'll make sure that we get you whatever information and support um, that you need to develop your emergency action plan. Questions from the audience? Um, hi, my name is Leonardo. I have a question regarding the notification flow charts. Um, I see that in the Santa Luisa Example, there are two different flow charts depending on the emergency level. Um, I'm aware that there are four different emergency levels. So my question is, do we need to have one notification uh, flow chart for each level of, of emergency? And I see in the Santa Luisa, they combine um, two emergency levels with one flow chart. So how does that work? Or what is the suggestion uh, regarding about it? 
So the notification and flow charts mirror the emergency levels. You have the choice. We, you know, we, 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 we made sure that we didn't prescribe to you um, exactly how to do your, your EAP because each dam is different. And we want to make sure that this is ultimately the dam owner's plan on how to mitigate a situation or how they're going to address a situation in their dam. So you have the option as a dam owner to either combine certain flow charts that may make sense. High flow and non, you know, uh, um, non-failure emergency are pretty similar for a lot of dams. For some dams, they're, they're a little differently. Um, all we really ask is that you do what's right for you, that you make sure that you contact the, 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 all the public safety agencies that are required, um, and the rest is up to you. Question from online. We typically perform annual call down drills for our FERC EAPs in the fall of every year. I do not recall seeing the June 30th deadline in the regulations regarding the drills and exercises. Is there any leeway in performing the drills based on the calendar year versus the California fiscal year? In addition, are there any templates or samples that can be um, provided about the annual exercise? Um, so I'll answer that question this way. As long as you do it um, once a year, you can, gen I mean, you can generally pick any date as long as you're consistent with it. We, we have to go off of, the, the, of the, the, the state fiscal year because that's when the, the execution of the legislation occurred. So that's, when, that's why it's a, a July 1st to June 30th or, or 31st, whatever it may be. Um, but as long as you pick a date, and do it. Every, do the call down drill every single um, year around the, the same time. You sh you'll meet the, the the requirements of the legislation. With regards to tools and resources, we're currently building um, a little bit of an exercise toolkit to assist um, dam owners um, in performing these this exercise. However, ultimately, it's not a high bar for for uh, to meet this requirement. You have to exercise the notification flow chart. So you have to make sure that you're, call, that you're doing that once a year, calling every single individual in your flow chart. Now, you can understand the importance of that, right? If there is a phone number that's been disconnected, if there's a new person um, um, in, in the game, you want to make sure that you are learning that during an exercise and not during an actual event. So we want to make sure that that, that, that that's, that, you know, that that, the goal is still kept in mind, right? Shake hands, introduce yourselves, know who the players are in, in, within your, your jurisdiction if there were an incident that were to, were to occur. Jose, I heard her mention FERC in there, uh, the Federal Energy mm -hmm. uh, Regulatory Commission. Do they supersede, do they have any type of requirements that might be more than what we have here for the state that our mm -hmm. dam owners need to keep in mind? Certainly, FERC has a lot of requirements that, that, that go above and beyond what the state requires. And we always work with FERC regulated dams um, um, to make sure that, that we don't double um, hit them, right? A lot of the requirements that FERC already has will meet the requirements of the California legislation. In fact, that was the, the thinking behind some of the, the, the clauses um, um, within this legislation. So by all means, we always ask for FERC regulated dams to work with us directly, give us a call, um, we'd be happy to walk you through some of the requirements that will meet both the state, um, the state regulations and FERC. Questions in the audience? Andy. Yeah, but we're recording, we want people online to be able to hear you too, so we'll bring you a microphone. Um, concerning doing the, the emergency action plan yourself and you, you decide you're going to get up and you're going to go into town and try to contact the people that are going to be, uh, you're going to be contacting if there's an emergency. And for me, I'm in Placer County. I think I have a fairly small dam. It's on our private property. What if I walk into Placer County or Cal Fire and go, okay, I need to talk to you guys. And they go, we don't know what the heck you're talking about. And we don't have an emergency action plan. And then who, if, if my dam starts to fail and I call them and go, okay, there's water coming out of it now, you know, how am I going to know at this point whether or not they have moved forward with this process to inform the maybe 10 houses that are below my dam that they better go stand on their roof? You know what I mean? 
So, so let me break that question up into a few, and I might have, if I miss something, please feel free to engage with me. So the first thing is, the, the question is essentially, as a dam owner, how do I get my public safety agencies involved in, in the planning process? So as a dam owner um, in, your, in your own backyard, you should you know, try to build the relationships you know, inherent with your fire department and your law, as well as your OES. Most of these agencies will be happy and able to talk to you, um, help to address some of the questions that you may have, and be involved in your planning process. But we understand that that may be a little bit of in, intimidating for some people who are not necessarily in the, in, in, in the business of public safety, right? I don't come with a badge, I don't come with a uniform. Um, however, Cal OES is here to help you. You know, if you have any questions about the players that, that should be involved within your planning process, or you're having some difficulty contacting some public safety agencies, we are more than happy to help you if you reach out to us. Once again, our email is eap at caloes.ca.gov. Now, I also want to make something clear, that the legislation doesn't require public safety agencies to engage with you during this planning process. Most will, however, but there is no requirement, no legal requirement for them to engage. But from, you know, since I work with most of these public safety agencies, I can tell you a lot of them will be very happy to help you happy to get to know you, they'll take down your phone number because they want to be the first to know, right, if your dam has any issue at all. Now, there's a secondary part of the question that my brain has already forgotten. Do you? <laughs> Somebody without ADD can, can help us out? If you think about it, we'll come back to it. All right. We have another, que another question from the audience? Or? Right here, Sean. Um, I might be the only one in the room that didn't know that the regulations had been adopted on November 29th. So was a notification sent out or, and I just missed it, or how would we know that? You didn't miss it. We haven't sent it out yet. Um, uh, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to have FAQs up online and some additional resources rather than just hitting all the owners with the new regulations, especially since it was November 29th, right before a, the deadline for many, many owners. And we have a clause in there that that continued before from the emergency regulations that allows us to approve maps that are substantially compliant with the regulations. So um, we just got the FAQs up on our website and um, we're going to, this this workshop was also kind of part of our outreach to inform owners. So you know you didn't miss anything. <laughs> Online question. Uh, this is back similar along with the FERC um, uh, question. For dams also under FERC, FERC jurisdiction, which already had requirements for EAPs that have been approved and accepted, would they be considered acceptable by DSOD and Cal OES? So that's, um, that's not quite a yes and no question. Um, the FERC guidelines are P64 compliant for the most part. Um, I mean, it's, I, I, I still haven't been able to find a really good um, example of how or, or, or an area where they disagree. So if you have followed FERC guidelines to the T, you will be 99% of the way there. I just can't 100% certify without looking at your dam. Um, however, you are very close to, to meeting all the requirements within the federal guidelines um, of, for dam safety, emergency action planning. Um, but it's hard to say yes um, outright. Um, however, in, my ex in our experience, most FERC EAPs that have come to us have a significant less um, um, requirement for revisions. I mean, we're talking about significant, um, significantly less. So. If you do have particular questions about your dam, please reach out back to us. Um, we'd be happy to take a look at it um, if you haven't already submitted it and get back to you on it. But I definitely think that the, the FERC um, regulated dams are way ahead of the curve. Kristen, before you jump in, just real quick to clarify though, if they've had an EAP approved through FERC, mm -hmm. they still have to go through the state process. Yes. And I'd like to add one, one main difference between federal um, rules and the state requirements are that um, California requires maps for critical appurtenant structures and FERC doesn't, so that would be probably the biggest, most obvious difference, I would think. 
Um, so if your dam doesn't have any critical appurtenance structures, there may not be any substantive differences. We attempted to write the regulations so that they were consistent with FERC. Um, I think that's all I wanted to add. And I'll just add that um, FERC also requires the sunny day failure as well as the storm-induced failure to be superimposed uh, and submitted um, with your inundation map uh, submittal. DSOD uh, requires just the sunny day failure as a minimum, although you may submit a storm-induced failure in lieu of your sunny day failure map. So if you, um, if you follow the FERC guidelines and model both a storm-induced failure and a sunny day failure, then that would meet the DSOD and FERC requirements. I'll just add one more thing. The FERC requirements that she's talking about, I don't think we've referenced that document yet during this workshop. That's called um, FEMA P946, which is the Federal Guidelines for Inundation Mapping. And that's, I think, on our website. Questions in the audience? You want, now we'll go back over to online. Tying back into the appurtenance structures, the next question is, our inundation map was approved, but we may have erroneously not included an appurtenance structure. What should we do next? I think from DSOD's perspective, we would want you to contact us immediately. Um, Faye, do you wanna talk about the EAP? I mean, uh, assuming that this is only related to the inundation map, I'll, I'll defer to you guys. But obviously, with, with within the EAP, we're going to be looking for not only the dam failure um, a model, but also the critical appurtenance structures, because we do physically look at um, if the if if the footprint is different than the main footprint of the dam, because that may change the planning assumptions that you may have to take for the emergency action plan. So to follow up on that, you would contact your area engineer and you can confirm whether or not a structure is a critical appurtenant structure. Next question, are the inundation maps and EAPs published? Uh, the owner is asking because they may not want to include private residents' phone numbers as contacts if this is the case. So the way that SB 92 is written, the inundation maps, once they are approved, must be made publicly available. Right now we're doing that on our website. Um, but SB 92 also says that the, nothing in the legislation means that the EAPs need to be made publicly available. So Cal ES is not publishing EAPs at all. We, you know, we're, that's, that's now something we're actively doing. We have another question in the audience right here. No, right, right up front here. Um, sorry. Um, how, how much should the critical appurtenance structure part be integrated into the rest of the emergency action plan, like in terms of uh, emergency level determination? Um, because in the past, it's kind of like, everything is in the context of the safety of the dam and not the cast, so, yeah. So, so I think that's, I mean, that's very dam specific. If your critical appurtenance structure poses a threat, then the planning process has to be done independent um, of the dam. If the, the channel where it's gonna be, or the footprint of the, of the critical appurtenance structure is different. So meaning that if you're, if, if I don't know how, to, that nobody knows any, let me see. So if the critical partner structure will go in the main channel, well, it's only gonna inundate an extra 100 feet, right? Mm -hmm. Let's assume that it's right next to the dam itself. That's no big deal. We'll look at the maps and say, hey, the, the planning assumptions will not change because the critical partner structures are not you know, on the opposite side of the dam. But if your dam were to have a critical appurtenant structure on the opposite side of the dam, you know, let's just say a quarter of a mile away, half a mile away, and it's gonna inundate an entirely different channel before it links back up to the main channel, then we will expect for, for you to have done your due diligence to, to identify if there's another jurisdiction there or if there's houses there, is there a golf course, whatever it may be. Is it a different city, county, is it, you know, so we want you to make sure that you've thought about that, and that, that you know, that you've included that as part of your planning process. Um, uh, 
um, in general. So we'll verify that. However, most dams do not have that, um, you know, where, whereby a critical appurtenance structure is a completely opposite side of the dam. Does that answer your question? Okay. The next question is, um, if you can clarify what needs to be submitted in the shapefile or GIS format, there seems to be a little bit of confusion on the boundaries. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a very good question. Um, so we have a few sections in the regulations that address the geospatial file submittals. Um, the first of which is the reporting standards um, section or of the regulations, uh, which describe the projection information for the geospatial files um, and the format of the rasters and the vectors. Um, as far as the geospatial files go, the submittal section of the regulation, section 335.14, um, require the inundation boundary vector file to be submitted. And in the previous section that I cited, um, it mentions that the format would be in, um, as a shape file or as a feature class in a, ge a file geodatabase. <clears throat> as far as your rasters go, please submit um, the flood wave arrival time raster, the maximum velocity raster, and the uh, maximum depth um, raster. And please ensure that those rasters, uh, and verify that those rasters, or the geospatial files are projected to the Teal Albers projection. And feel free to give us a call um, if you have any other questions, but in a nutshell, that's what we are looking for. Questions in the audience? Yep, right here in the room, Sean. Hi there. Hi. Um, my question is about the modeling extents. So um, I, we have a dam that um, it discharges into a significant river, and um, it, it it goes through a major res reservoir as well. And we're trying to determine the extent of modeling it rather the and um, the incremental rise downstream the, the reservoir downstream is still greater than one foot. Is there a return frequency that would be appropriate rather than continuing the modeling further downstream or like a two year return period or anything mm -hmm. along those lines? Um, we've already gone 70 mm -hmm. miles, so it's... Uh, yeah, um, to... if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're asking about the downstream extent and whether or not um, there's a certain frequency that would dictate um, what that extent would be. Um, so we actually don't, um, well, one, we don't require storm-induced failure, so we don't prescribe a storm frequency, and we don't um, require that the incremental depth downstream, um, you know, we don't set that as the criteria for the, the extent of the inundation. It's simply when the inundation reaches a one-foot maximum depth. That's when you can. Um, that's when you can truncate the extent of your model. Um, also, if your inundation is absorbed by a larger water body, then you can terminate your inundation there. Um, do you have yeah, anything else to add? Yeah, if it's confined to a channel, um, like if it's in a large river or if it's in a bypass that's designed as a flood waterway. If it's confined to a channel and you, you are sure that it will remain confined to a channel and not break out later downstream as the topography changes, you can terminate your model. And if you have any questions, because we understand these are so model specific, you can call us. And if you expect to have high flows continue in that channel or water body, I think you mentioned that um, you expect to have depths greater than one foot beyond um, the reservoir then you can put a note on the inundation map letting emergency managers know that high flows are continued, are, are expected to continue beyond um, the inundation extent. Question online. Next question is, I own a small dam which is classified as high risk because there are two houses located downstream. 
I'm having a hard time to get engineers to work on the inundation map as they are all too busy with other big dam owners. Please advise how I should proceed to fulfill the imposed requirements. That is a question that we get a lot, yeah. And because there are um, houses downstream of the dam, I, I don't think that the hazard would change. But um, the, I would recommend the first step is to contact your area engineer. It sounds like you've already contacted some engineers, and I know that um, that a lot of engineers are really busy right now and have a backlog because everybody's um, working really hard to try to meet these deadlines. But if you'd like a, a longer list of people to call, you can contact your area engineer, and then you can always call us and, and let us know that you're having trouble and, and what progress you have made. And um, I would say communicating with both us and Cal OES if you've already gone past your deadline is always a good idea. But we understand and you're not the only one in that situation. Questions in the audience? Go back, do we have more questions online? Not at the moment. Okay, Sean. Is Cal OES looking for the inundation study TM as well with the submittal of the EAP? I'm sorry, one more time. Are you looking for the inundation study TM with the submittal of the EAP? So, so I am not an engineer, so let me refer to my expert. TM? <laughs> the technical memory. There we go. <laughs> so when it comes to the emergency action plan, the, the thing that emergency managers will zero in on is the inundation maps. Um, so that's what we, I always encourage dam owners to really kind of focus on. Um, I'll, I don't wanna, I don't wanna speak on behalf of all emergency management, um, but I can tell you that a lot of them probably won't be looking at the inundation study. Um, that's, I mean, I, I, I still need a calculator just to, you know, do a tip at, at a restaurant, so, um, myself. So I won't be looking at that, I can guarantee you. However, what we do care about is the fact that you have the, all the inundation maps that, that you need to do, that you need to have, critical appurtenant structures, obviously, and, you know, we wanna make sure that you're, that you're putting in the EAP and hard copy the critical maps that are necessary, not just the full the extent of the model, but also the more zeroed in, you know, um, um, or more um, zoomed in versions of the dams um, of the dams footprint. Um, maybe key key things of note within your infrastructure or downstream. Okay. So we, we're running way early, but if we're out of questions, um, we'll probably end early. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Here we go, right here. Uh, I have a question about the inundation boundary. Is that gonna be a separate map from the maximum velocity and maximum depth, or is that shown in the same map as the maximum depth? Uh, so I understand your question about is the boundary, the, the outside extents separate, uh, shown separately on the map from the other, all the other information that's being displayed from the model. And we used to prescribe in, the, in our first emergency regulations, we prescribed how things needed to be displayed on the map. But in our conversations, mostly with emergency managers, we understand that they, they like, a lot of them like to make their own maps from the layers. Um, some of them like to, aren't very GIS savvy and they just like to photocopy the maps from the EAP during an emergency. And so because of this, they're really adept at reading a variety of different types of maps, these emergency managers. And so we became a lot less prescriptive in how we required things to be shown. So um, on the PDF that's required that you submit, we don't say how you need to show those things. So you can show um, multiple maps that represent one inundation map. So you could have one set of maps that's the boundary, one set of maps that's the velocity, or you could combine them as long as they're still readable. We understand that if you're doing a two-dimensional model and you have rasters, you're not gonna be able to fit all of those on one map probably or on one map product. And um, our understanding with the emergency managers, they're used to reading multiple maps that represent one scenario. And so that's, that's fine for them, they can work with that. Now the geospatial files, they are just separate files. And so we're working on displaying all of those in a web-based GIS application so people can download them or turn them on and off and, and use them however it works best for them. 
Oh. So I'll jump in real quick. This is an excellent opportunity for dam owners to work with the public safety agencies. There's nothing wrong with going, you know, knocking on your fire department, police, um, officer emergency services at the county level and asking them, hey, what are you looking for? What would be what would be helpful to you in an emergency? And they can work hand in hand with you to, to tell you which maps they would prefer to see um, in their EAP. And I'll just add um, for the GIS file submittals, we are looking for a separate inundation boundary vector file and that's separate from the rasters for the maximum depth and the maximum velocity. It was that um, getting at the core of your question? Okay. Additional questions in the audience? Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, it says here, does the plan document surveillance and monitoring activities? What would be considered surveillance and monitoring activities on a very small dam? That really depends on your dam and, and you know the purpose of it. Some obviously some dams have CCTV cameras. Some have um, electronic monitoring for for their you know gauges downstream upstream of, of their dams. It just really depends um, for your particular dam. If it's a small one, give us a call. Work with us. We can work with you to kind of to see what would fit best for your dam. But I don't but I don't want you to get hung up on the fact that oh my god I don't have CCTV camera pointed right at my dam right no 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 that's that's it's commensurate to the to the to the to the actual dam itself all of the requirements so that's why they're it's not prescriptive and that's why it's gonna be very hard to ever make them fully prescriptive. Uh, would the yearly reporting or inspection that is done by Department of Water Resources be a part of that? I think that's a part of that certainly. Okay. Because I know I'm not, I mean, I, naturally I live next door to it, so I'm, I'm looking at it every day, I'm monitoring it every day. See, to me, that would be some pretty good monitoring right there. <laughs> and I don't want anybody to think that that's, not, um, that, that that's not an effective tool. I mean, if I live above a dam, I think I'm going to know if my dam broke, right? How am I going to address it in this document, though? I say, oh, I'm sitting there looking out my window every day. I mean, what do you want in, we the, will, in the document? We will work with you on that, and you could even state a narrative, say, hey, look, you know, my, the dam is really outside my window. If something were to happen, I would be the first person to know. You know, having a person who lives on site is probably the most effective type of monitoring because some dams do not have um, a, a, a physical being um, right next to the dam. Not all of them do, at least. So don't, you know, I want to make sure that Thank everybody you. hears this. Don't be intimidated by the review tool nor by the planning process that is involved within an emergency action plan. When I say that all of you are capable of doing it, I mean that we, Cal OES, will step in and we will assist you with every single step of the way, um, as well as your local public safety agencies. Okay, and that was another thing I was wondering as far as the local agencies go, um, and we've got um, structures downstream, are they going to be the ones that are responsible for, for <coughs> contacting the people in those structures? It depends on your dam. So <clears throat> I'll give you two examples. Okay. Some dam owners have taken it upon them to say, hey, look, you know, those structures are literally right below the dam. It would be less than five minutes before the flood wave would arrive. We have taken it upon ourselves to personally call them. Okay. And those people at times are ahead of the notification than even, you know, um, the OES manager for the county. And we would look at that and say, wow, look, you know, in this particular situation, we want to make sure that those individuals get the notice first. Right. So... That dam owner has taken it upon themselves to reach out to those people. Okay. At times, um, what other dam owners have done is that they worked with their local public safety agencies, and they've set, and and they worked out an agreement whereby they would call um, the individuals that are that are below the dam. Okay. Um, it just really depends. But those are two ways to meet the requirement, nonetheless, right? And I think I'll, I I do find, and and my team um, made this, will probably agree with me that. Most of the time, dam owners take it upon themselves and say if they see a true um, threat um, to life, um, um, and they'll be the they'll be the ones that own those calls. Okay. Um, as far as um, instigating that procedure, um, I'm just thinking out loud here and trying to cover all my bases before I leave. Um, no, I think I've got it. Okay, oh, the darkness thing. Does it provide information regarding response during periods of darkness? I'm looking at my dam and thinking about my situation. Um, 
I wouldn't even know how to address that in an EPA, EAP. <laughs> I mean, what do, what, do you, what are you guys looking for in here? I mean, it's on private property. It's, you know, I can drive across it all night long. What do you want? I don't so know. one of the things that we're looking at is, for example, if there was going to be some sort of an issue with your dam, that wasn't quite an imminent failure situation uh -huh. whereby how are you going to monitor it during periods of darkness? Is there, you know, you're going to go out there with, with one of those big old, you know, road um, um, lights or, you know, you've got to have a plan. It doesn't mean that you have to have on-site, you know, headlamps or something. That's not what we're saying. But we want you to think about that. Say, how would if the, if this were to happen, how am I going to be able to see my dam, you know, at night? Okay. That's yes. kind of what we're thinking. But once again, we can definitely work with you um, to find some solutions, particularly for your dam, mm -hmm. um, um, if you give us a call. Okay. Sounds good. Thank I want, you. I want to address something. Another question that I'm not sure if it was yours or on, on the phone that we didn't answer with regards to putting personal information on the EAP flow charts. Every single phone number that you receive as dam owners from public safety agencies or even a private um, dwelling um, is all personal information, right? The EAPs are, are a safe place to, to put that because they're only released to the to, to individuals who have a need to know within your public safety agencies. So I want to make sure that that's clear that, that you know, make sure that you um, um, you know, do a comprehensive notification list for anybody that you think needs to know. Um, and I think that every, all the information will be safe. So we do have another question online, but before we go there, I know when I come to workshops like this and a lot of information gets thrown out, I'll be driving home, I'll go, oh, I wanted to ask that question. Why didn't I ask that? So how can you do that? Well, as you see on the screen here, and uh, we've talked about these emails multiple times, uh, you could email us any questions to either DSOD or to Cal OES, uh, DSOD questions on the inundation maps, go to mapregs, M-A-P-R-E-G-S, at water.ca.gov, EAP questions to EAP at caloes.ca.gov. Both the websites are very easy to find. Uh, DSOD is damsafety.water.ca.gov. Cal OES is caloes.ca.gov for specifically for dams backslash dams. So feel free as you're driving home, you think about wait till you get home because we don't text and drive. <laughs> Give us an email if you think of something um, and we are more than happy to get back to you with an answer right away. So we have another question that came in online while we were waiting and. Yes, so the question is, I have visited the Cal OES website and noticed the revised date was July 2013 regarding the FEMA requirements. And they want to confirm, is this the most updated I'm pretty sure it is. In fact, no, it is. It is absolutely the 2013 version is the most updated P64 federal guidelines for dam safety emergency action planning. Yes. All right, any additional questions before we close? Well, I just want to thank you all for coming out. I know this is very important to you as dam owners. And uh, I think the biggest takeaway that I got from today is that these people are here to help you. Just pick up the phone, shoot them an email, they will walk you through any question you might have, uh, both in your maps and your EAPs. They're here to help you. Um, so thank you for our panel and for our presenters earlier. Um, on behalf of uh, DWR's Division of Safety of Dam and the Governor's Office of Emergency Service, uh, once again, thank you for coming out today and, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.